Magic is central to high fantasy adventure gaming. It has so many different aspects and it's easily the most exciting thing to spend many hours pondering. Outside of actually playing role playing games, a large part of the enjoyment of the hobby is simply our shared love of talking about magic items, character builds, weird monsters and how we can take ideas from video games and cartoons and put them into our role playing games thinly disguised as something else. Role-playing and wargaming enthusiasts are typically knowledgeable and interesting individuals. We tend to have wide-ranging conversations on all sorts of topics, but get us talking about magic items and we come up with some unique ideas. In the current role-playing climate, it's never been a better time to stray away from Dungeons & Dragons' traditional game system and cosmology, to take a step back and breathe some life into the wild blue yonder of what if. What if there were no elemental, astral, or outer planes? What if there was just the realm of fire, the underworld, the land of eternal reward, the mists, the great void, or the lands of the forgotten gods, upside down and inside out land, a world shaped like a pancake or a donut or something? It's all too easy to shackle your world building to the template of D&D and forget that this is actually a game that is supposed to get wild and freaky. So let's take the gloves off, so to speak. We are now in a much broader, more freewheeling conceptual environment where we are free to spitball ideas and dig into topics such as why such magic items exist, how all these bizarre new concepts work together. Despite my reputation for going into the most profound detail on game lore, I often don't involve lore in my own games for an excellent reason. Players don't find my world building as interesting as what is going on with their characters and their decisions and consequences impacting their characters in the game. If I start rambling on about the deep history of a flaming sword with a large ruby set in the blade without them asking me to, specifically, I should expect them to roll their eyes at the back of their skull and fall into a deep slumber reasonably quickly. They are there to be the story, not to hear a story being told to them. Granted, I do all the gaming these days with grown adults who perhaps want to spend their time gaming to recharge their mental batteries rather than spend that same energy trying to figure out what they really need to know and what is just, as we say, fluff text. World building is fun for dungeon masters. It's only fun for players who experience it, not hear about it. Magic items, well, we can break that rule a little bit, but not too much. And players really don't care if we step pretty far outside of the standard cosmology of Dungeons and Dragons. They really don't. But a magical cosmology is needed for a high fantasy game involving the supernatural. Magic realms beyond the everyday adventuring world are pretty handy when talking about magic items. For example, you can say that the number of plus one bonuses a magic weapon or suit of armor has represents the number of different dimensions the material parts of that item is made from. So a sword can cut through steel because a part of that sword blade is not conforming to the usual laws of physics. This is why it may be glowing or lighter than expected. It's actually radioactive, but in a way that's harmless to a being from the player character's reality. It's made of metal that not only doesn't fit on your world's periodic table, it doesn't even conform to the customary laws of gravity. So sure, you may not be able to store the mind or soul of a sapient being inside an ordinary rock, but an otherworldly gemstone? Sure, why not? And we can just put that in the game and call it done. But there is more fun to be had, not just for the person making the world up, but for the player whose character will interact with that item. We can do a lot with just a little bit more backstory to the item and the kind of mind housed inside or anchored to it. Creatures without a strict need for a physical form in the first place are ideal candidates, so elemental, undead, or demonic spirits would be all you really need, but there are other options. I started writing out as many as I could think of just off the top of my head and restricted myself to no more than 8 to 10 different effects or influences I thought might apply to the Magi item based on just the background origin of the intellect now bound to it. It was too extensive for a video script, so I will put that list as a set of random roll tables on my Patreon page. Free access, you don't have to be a patron to see and use them. Just give me a few days to spell check it and make it look pretty for you, as I tend to be wild when I'm just typing my thoughts into a WordPad file. 
Another reason to involve otherworldly materials in magic item creation is the difficulty and danger of attaining that stuff. In traditional Dungeons & Dragons, going to another plane of existence is not exceptional. We almost expect it to happen, but in folklore, mythology and popular media, crossing over into another dimension is rare and extremely dangerous. Just looking at Dungeons & Dragons here and how planet travel has been increasingly normalized, when was the last time you had a player character or had your own player character cross over into the Fey realm, then return only to forget everything that happened to them there, or they returned years, decades, or even centuries after they left, with everyone just assuming they died a long time ago? That is normal for the Fey realm. It's probably massively disruptive for a role-playing campaign, but that is just one of the fundamental aspects of the Fey that has just been quietly edited out of the game and dumped into the too hard basket. If you are a brand new arrival to role-playing by way of the pervasive 5th edition of D&D, this may be news to you, but indeed you have read or heard or seen some traditional folklore elsewhere, and you know that this is part of the Fey folklore. Falling asleep to fairy music and slumbering for 300 years, eating the enchanted apple and falling into an ageless coma. The Fae is a realm of fairy tales as reality, dreams as reality, and people sleeping beyond reality's norms. How does Peter Pan fly? He believes he can, and he lives in Neverland. You see references to this all through Fae folklore. The land of Nod. Fairies have magical sleep dust, and so on. All the magical realms in D&D have at least had rules and themes like that. Also, they would leave a part of themselves within the person who visited them, which makes sense on even a basic level. Your character breathes the air, drinks the water and eats the food. Our cells are made up of what we eat and drink. So spend enough time in that realm, part of that person is now made of that realm. Just like the enchanted object, they are a little bit weird. Spend enough time there, they get a lot more weird. This is why you have creatures from other realms who get changed by being there. Shadow dragons, elemental antelope, whatever they may be, they are now a blend of the two realms. Now, considering that famous heroes and adventurers or wizards, villains, saints and such of the fantasy world have probably crossed over into other realms of existence in their epic lifetimes, it's not so weird to think that, oh yeah, no wonder their sword is magical and named after them. The items they carry with them for a long time may have crossed into many different realms, and they may get more magical every time. You could spring this on your players the next time their character survives such a trip and returns to their original dimension. Suddenly, their sword glows when a particular creature type is nearby. Say what? they ask. You don't need to explain it. Let them figure it out. Yes, items you carry with you that are a substantial part of the growing legend of your player character will become magic items and more potent spontaneously over time. At some point, the item may become so in tune with you, they feel like it's a companion, that it has a spirit of its own. And one day, it just does. Consider this, you never really find a magic item, and the only thing that is magical about it is the fact that it is intelligent. So maybe the intelligence only occurs or can occur or be imprinted on, housed in or anchored to an item that is already a bit otherworldly, magical and slightly legendary. Without explaining anything more, we now have an excellent framework that a player of the game will be drawn into because now they don't have to be an artificer or powerful wizard devoted servant of divine or infernal powers, all they need to do is seek out or stumble into enough freaky and outlandish locations, pop through a portal and escape by the skin of their teeth enough times, and they may have their trusty old sledgehammer transform slowly but surely into mighty Mjolnir. My name is AJ Pickett. I've got a Kickstarter currently going for some mighty silicone battle mats, which you should definitely go and check out if you haven't already. Thanks for listening. As always, I'll be back with more for you very soon.